welcome everyone to episode six of Beer on the Brain, where we're going to talk about where wild Britannomyces might be found. For those of you who don't know, Britannomyces is an unusual strain of yeast that is sometimes present in wine and in beer. Now in the winemaking world, Britannomyces is a problem. It causes a contamination that causes something called cork taint or mouse taint, which as the name suggests are an unpleasant flavor in these products. The beer world is a little different. This yeast is deliberately used in a variety of different beers, uh, stock ales and lambics uh, and other sour beers and farmhouse ales in particular, often want the character of Britannomyces to add sort of an earthy note uh, to the beer itself. But regardless of which industry we are talking about, where this yeast comes from is a mystery. It just seems to appear as these products are being aged. Now the wine industry is really concerned about where the wild source of Britannomyces is because of course it causes contamination of the products. And yet they've had a heck of a time identifying where it comes from. Now the most obvious place to look would be on grapes. And most studies either don't find it on grapes, or like this study here, they find it in just the most minute amounts that it's almost undetectable, and they need very specialized technology and techniques to actually find the, the yeast. But what these studies also find is the wineries themselves are full of Britannomyces. Something about the environment inside of the winery is really conducive to this yeast's growth. And what this actually means is those yeasts in the field may not even have come by that Britannomyces naturally. It may actually have been transmitted to them from the winery by winds or by workers moving around. Another possibility is that Britannomyces might be present in wood. Britannomyces can eat some of the unusual sugars present in wood, which has led some to think that maybe Britannomyces is a decomposer of wood. Barrels are made from aged wood staves, and so maybe the aging process allows Britannomyces to get into the wood, and this is now where it again gets into the wine or into the beer. It turns out this also isn't the case. When studies look at the effect of wood on Britannomyces growth, they always have to add the Britannomyces either from a contaminated wine or deliberately through some sort of a culture. So it's not in the barrel to start with, it's introduced at some point in the production of the wine or the beer. And this is essentially where sort of the wine and beer making fields have ended their studies. They're not really gone beyond this point. So I decided to do a deeper dive and look at this from a slightly different angle. And I started off looking at the evolutionary history of Britannomyces. Now Britannomyces and Saccharomyces, our conventional brewer's yeast, actually do share a common ancestor, which they split from around 200 million years ago, giving rise to the Britannomyces versus Saccharomyces lineages. But what's interesting is in both of these species, same thing happened to them around 100 million years ago. And this is they both evolved something called a crabtree-like metabolism. And what crabtree metabolism is, is the ability to ferment sugars even when oxygen is present. And this is unusual because fermentation is very fast, but is very inefficient in terms of the amount of energy it produces compared to using oxygen. So it's a little unusual that organisms would evolve this capacity. But one thing that's interesting is this corresponds with when the first flowering plants evolved, and so there's maybe a link there. In fact, it suggests that Saccharomyces and Britannomyces might share the same lifestyle. Now, the life cycle of Saccharomyces is actually fairly well understood. Saccharomyces itself is often found in leaf litter. So these are leaves that have fallen to the forest floor and are undergoing decomposition. And here, bacteria and other fungi are releasing enzymes which will break down the complex carbohydrates present in the leaves to form simple sugars. The bacteria and then the fungi are doing this because they want to eat those sugars, but Saccharomyces is there and it basically steals these. This allows the Saccharomyces to grow and to stay alive, and it also allows it to produce esters. And the reason why it produces esters is they smell sort of fruity or flowery, and this will now bring in insects which will pick up the Saccharomyces and carry them to fruits or to flowers. And here is where that crab tree metabolism kicks in, and it allows these to very rapidly consume the sugar and the nectar or in the fruit juice, undergo very rapid proliferation, and they also produce a lot of ethanol when they do this, which suppresses the growth of other organisms, and it really allows them to monopolize the sugars present in these sources. As these yeasts are growing, they of course hope that another insect will come in and carry them off to another uh, sugar source, but if they don't, eventually that flower or fruit will fall to the ground, returning these yeasts to the forest floor, where this cycle can now continue. So does Britannomyces do the same thing? Well, when you look in the microbiome of insects, you find Saccharomyces in all of them, but I've yet to find a paper of more than two dozen that I've looked at that have identified Britannomyces within the insect microbiome. 
Now there's a lot less work looking at the organisms present in leaf litter, but the couple of studies that I found that look at this also did not find Britannomyces. So it doesn't look like Britannomyces is living the same lifestyle as Saccharomyces. And at this point I, I had kind of almost given up. But then a, a chance comment made on a brewing forum uh, led me down a slightly different road and I came across this unusual research article looking at the farming of dill and beans. And buried deep inside of this paper, I found a table looking at the most common bacterial and fungal species present in the rhizosphere of these organisms. And what was in this top 10 list? Well, Britannomyces. So what's this rhizosphere? So plants don't just simply grow in soil. They actually have a number of organisms that are intimately associated with their roots that are really critical for the growth and the health of that plant. And these bacteria and these fungi actually are fed by the root itself, and in turn, they provide nutrients back to the plant. And so this collection of microorganisms is what we call the rhizosphere. So maybe Britannomyces lives in the rhizosphere of plants, and this is its natural niche. But if this is the case, you'd think you would find it on things other than just dill and beans. So this is a relatively new area of study, and so there isn't a lot of papers on it. However, I did find studies showing Britannomyces present in the rhizosphere of sunflowers, of corn, of rice, of jute, and of cassava. I also looked to see if it was associated with the rhizosphere of wheat, barley, or grapes, and I didn't find any studies showing that, but I also didn't find any studies that looked for yeast. In fact, most of the studies I found looking at the rhizosphere of those plants used techniques to eliminate yeast from their sample. So maybe it's there as well. So has the mystery been solved? Is Britannomyces a fungus that grows within the rhizosphere of different plants? and maybe is carried onto grapes by the wind, or into wineries on the equipment and tools of the farm workers, or perhaps carried in through other processes, uh, and therefore is introduced uh, in that fashion from the soil into the wine? Well, we don't actually know. More work needs to be done to see if that's the case, but the answer to this question may literally have been right under our feet. So thank you so much for uh, sitting with me through this quick video. And I hope it was interesting, and we'll see you next time.